I am unashamed. What about you? Well, that was interesting. You, I, I'd never seen your uh, the healing that took place. A lot, a lot of these people overanalyze this. You, you got chronic back pain. Yep. It was like I don't know what's going on, and you were fixed with a five dollar boost to make yep. your leg longer than the other one. That's right. Five bucks. Five dollars. And the guy, he said, go get an MRI and then and let me look at it. Physical therapist. Not a not like a 10 years in school. He just said, get that for me. I said, so we'll get a picture taken of it. Everything is fine except his sacrum is what, where your buttocks are on both sides. That's where you both your hip, one, one hip joint and the other one. Well, you know, it would help probably if that was level. Yeah. <laughs> Mine was like this. Cocked well, down. It a, it's you, cocked down a little bit. You say, was it a football injury or you think no, he was born that way? born that way. So he says, so your sacrum's out of line. And I said, well, how do you fix that? He said, put a pad on you, the short leg. He said, lay down on the floor. I laid down on the floor. He took a tape measure. He said, yep. He said, that's your, 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 your right leg. I wish I could have seen this. <laughs> he, said, he said, your right leg is about almost a half inch shorter than your left one. I said, so you got two I said well, why is my left hip hurting if my right leg is too short? He said, because your sacrum has gone down on the right side. And it's causing mm. some little inflammation it's on the left me, hand side. He said, but there's nothing wrong with your hip. He said, your <laughs> hip looked like that of a young boy. You got two options. You can either make one shorter. <laughs> yeah. Or cut the other one off. Well, yeah. So to match up. <laughs> so they decided instead of to cut the short the long one off, you know, cut it, cut it and shorten the thing, they decided to build the other side up. And and he and he goes out in his car and he comes back. And he had one in his hand. He said, I, I have a few extras here. He said, he threw it over to me. He said, that'll knock it out. And I said, Surely not. I said, what's that thing cost, that pad? He said, $5. I said, well, give me my bill, folks. I said, now, I'm trusting what, you, what you're saying. I said, this has got to be one of the, I've got a rare genetic yeah. disease. He said, oh, no. He said, hundreds of them. Sometimes. He said, in fact, he said, there's a large percentage of human beings where one leg is shorter than the other one. He said, you're one of them. I said, so that's just common. They, he said, we see it all the time. What's amazing to me is you were, I mean, an NFL caliber quarterback. Could you, or were you fast? I just had a quick release with a football. Oh, so you weren't mobile and, in And the I pocket. could take a step and throw the ball 65 yards. You know, I just take a step and throw it 65 yards, or I could get a running start. It still goes 65 yards. But did yards. you ever like scramble and run? Could you? I mean, was you, oh. or were you more like a? Were you more like a Ben Roethlisberger? Well, he's pretty. That's probably. A bad I've got obliterated of and just obliterated. The linemen are coming. They're screaming as they're coming, or running very <laughs> heavily. <laughs> they're coming after you. I weigh 175 pounds, and they weigh 220, 230, nah, 240. you weighed more than that. And they just, at the time, that's what I weighed. Really? 165 pounds. So here they come, and every time, back in that day, every time you threw it, 1,001, mm -hmm. then they, they, hit, hit they hit, you, hit you on the ground. Now they hit me high, they hit me low, they hit me every way you could be hit. And everybody was going, yay. Now they 15 yard penalty for what they yeah. were doing to me. Yeah. They finally said, they're going to kill him quarterbacks. I mean, there's five of them coming at him and they ain't him slowing down. He throws it and then they hit him yeah. like I couldn't stop. You, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so you did like they do that the little. little so I took a curve. Did they do the little bounce move on you? Oh, what are you talking about? A lot of them. You're, you're coming back to the right, 
and you're a halfback, you have a split backfield, the halfback supposed to, you know, get to the left and protect my rear, rear. Yeah. So I'm coming back. I'm looking down the field. I don't have eyes in the back of my head. But instead of him going out there and blocking the dude, he turns the wrong way, kind of kind of gets up in the middle trying to rooster yeah. fight. Well, here comes the defensive end. <laughs> Most of them are about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, 230. And here they come, just like this, coming toward me. My back's turned. And as soon as I get back there, 1,001, 1,002, they just drop. And back in the day, a headbutt was what you longed for. Yeah. Get your head <laughs> and butt him. And I would come over there just my face mask rooting up the dirt. So I got dirt all on my face mask where my head just went just scraping up the dirt. I'd run off the field after that and everybody would run up there and say, You all right? I mean, cause they yeah. thought, Oh, that you had to be dead. he's hurt. Yeah. But I said, Yeah, I'm all right. I said, That that, that was a bruiser. I said, Son, you turn around and you chew your half back out. Don't do that anymore. You got to protect me on the back, man. <laughs> yeah, you know he blitzed. Well, maybe that's how your leg might have gotten shorter. It didn't help any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and there are some genetic issues in our family because you know, uh, Granny had the scoliosis, which is more up, you know, on your shoulder blade. But but Phyllis has it, and so does uh, Cy and Judy had it. You uh, got to remember well. when the phone call came down. And some and Gordon Dasher figured it out because he's married to my sister before she passed on. And he said, Gordon says, you know, I've done a little research. He said, it's worse than we thought. We, instead of third cousins, my, yeah. my mom and dad, Ma and Pa, instead of third cousins, they were second cousins. Yeah, you here know, we go. Whoops, it's all ma- it all makes sense <laughs> now. It all, you know, when you start the little inbreeding factor, you know. The tree doesn't You start have coming forks. out with one leg longer than the other, and you're like, hey, ooh. <laughs> I don't know how accurate who, all you, that Y'all is. were married with second cousin? Yeah, second. I, like, think he was, I think he was kidding, but. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. No, no I, I think he I was. But, hey, I don't know. I'll take it. I want everybody to know that uh, when people hear us expounding on various issues, some are like, ha, 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 you know, the people that say there's no God and all that. The Lord protects. This is uh, some, I I did a research study on keep it simple or the simplicity of the way you approach the Bible. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. I've often said, and some say, with a certain amount of pride that I'm a C plus person. Now, I don't know how simple minded that is, but you just had to figure it out on your own. I'm not a brain. The Lord protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Psalms 116, during my research, I'm just giving you some verses that deal with, with the simple hearted or simple minded. You're not a genius. And can you, how can you function? But, but God, in great patience and great detail, Psalms 116.6, Psalms 119.130, Psalms 119.129, you just start through all these verses and you work your way up to Matthew saying that the simple, the simple-minded are the ones that the kingdom, like little children, they, have a, they don't have the brain yet. Said that's the kind of people that end up in the kingdom. So I, I yeah, you're right. Good. It was quite the study because I, I just wanted to know well, how much uh, the Bible talks about just keep it simple. You know, we believe there's a God. We believe He created the heavens and the earth and us. He became flesh 2,021 years ago. Died on the cross for our sin. Buried, raised from the dead. There's the resurrection, the conquering of death. And you say, well. What else is, uh, where's the deep, deep uh, religious truths? I, I'd have pretty well covered what I just said. That's what all this is about. It is simple, Al, but profound. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And I think that's where people run in a, a run afoul when they try to make it more than it is. I mean, it's, you know, we, we've been studying the Bible here on this podcast for a couple of years. Yep. Obviously, you know, we love studying it. We love to discover things that apply to us. But you're right. I mean, it's it's a core understanding that always you – that's where you rest on. That's where your salvation is. You don't want to get out there too far where these things begin to upset the core of who you are, I think. 
That's well, I it. mean, you look at all the great institutions from the universities in our country who are deemed the elite, the smart, smartest of the smart. When it comes to the origin of life and how to extend life, they got nothing. Very little. <laughs> they got nothing. They don't even cover it historically. They don't. They don't really look at the historical Jesus, which is pretty dumb. The college professor that is now a brother up there, I asked him. I said, "You were in the history department. In fact, he taught your history class when you attended Northeast Al for a while." Old Sandy. He, yeah, he did, and and he was he was really he was a good teacher as well. Hey, let's take a quick break, Dad. Well, I have great news to share about our friends at Patriot Mobile. Uh, They've expanded their coverage dramatically, which is going to make it a lot easier for Americans to dump the big name carriers, if you'd like to, uh, that charge way too much and, of course, donate a lot of money to causes that we don't really believe in. So um, we partner with Patriot Mobile because they never try to silence and cancel people which I love that, that, that fit. you can switch with confidence because they use the same network as the large providers, but they just charge a lot less. You can keep your own phone if you'd like to, or buy a new one. You can build your own bundle. It's patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or you can give them a call 972 Patriot. So that's patriotmobile.com slash Phil or call them at 972 Patriot. You get a free premier activation this month if you use the offer code Phil. So check them out, patriotmobile.com slash Phil, 972 Patriot. Yeah, he said they were not allowed to cover the historical Jesus. He said, I, I was not allowed to, to provide that information. When we got to there, he said, we just jumped over it and kept on going. He because said, it's a fear. They're... they're you know, if you can't discuss all subjects, what what are you scared of? Why not deal with it? Look into it. Who was Jesus yeah. historically? We have anything written about him? Like a a lot was written about him. You you would think they would at least cover him, but I went to college for eight years, earned two degrees. No one ever brought his name up, not once. Yeah. That's why I think Ephesians is right, is our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So quit getting mad at the professors and the universities, but it's against the spiritual forces of evil because there's some kind of hidden agenda where it can't even be discussed. So you know it's not, it, it, it makes no sense. Remember when Stephen preached to them, they put their hands over their ears. Yeah. They were just screaming with their hands over their ears because he had just told them, you who violate the law, the given the law, you know, and who now break it, and you you murder the author of life. I mean, and boy, mm-hmm. I mean, did they see that was the historical Jesus they were talking about? But boy, did they get fired up! They killed a the man, Stephen, on the spot. Yeah, and there the Saul of Tarsus said, "When we <coughs> did that study, you're like, they would kill you if you brought up." The simple simplicity of Jesus coming down in flesh, dying, being buried, raised from the dead. That's all he was saying. He was just preaching them the message. And it's amazing they they killed the spokesman one after the other. It is amazing that it took hold anyway and went worldwide. We're products of that. You remember in Stephen's sermon um, in Acts 7, he he told him, he said, you you mentioned the prophets, and he said, you've... Our people, you have killed the prophets one right after the other, right up until the point of where you killed Jesus. Who predicted he was you know, coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you couldn't even predict. <laughs> it's the same mindset. And Jace is right, though. You can't you can't look at worldly institutions as a believer and think, well, this, you know, they need to get this right in terms of what's biblical. They're never going to get it right, which which that means we are they the ones that have on to do try. it. No. They're not even on try. No. They don't, they're not, I, I don't know why, you know, it's like all my kids, I'm proud to say, are way smarter than me at currently. They have way more knowledge. <laughs> well, I think you and Al are smarter than me. So <laughs> this is weird. Y'all are well schooled. So it's, well, it's the circle of life. I don't know. But I mean, the one thing I have studied 
is the Bible. And and it's not that I'm real smart. It's just the day in and day out, the sheer volume of studying with people and having discussions. Well, you know, after a while, I can't. I can't memorize anything, but I pretty much have the New Testament memorized as far as where everything is. Yep. And it's not because I tried to do that. It just, by constant use, it's just happened. So I don't yep. know. Maybe that makes you smart that way. But to me, it's going to come down to, to leading people to a relationship with the one who wrote it, which is, yeah. in a way, actually more brilliant than knowing the scriptures if you know the person who wrote it so that's why i think it it kind of flies in the face of academia maybe that verse that says knowledge puffs up but love builds up is something there because if you know a lot of religious groups that i know of they want to get into the deeper things of god or the theology and you know what happens we all know they wind up arguing with each other oh. there's no love it's like, and just fighting mad over not agreeing on things that are so deep that nobody really knows anyway. But, I mean, that's a problem in our society, in the religious world. Would you agree? Oh, a big problem. And meanwhile, that's why I say whether I go to people who are simple-minded or people who are very smart with events that I do, it's the same simple message. I try to keep it as simple as possible because it really is simple. Yeah. I heard somebody expounding on something, and I, I said, what, what, what can that individual, he, he's supposed to be some Bible scholar in the 1600s, I said, what can he give me that I don't already have with Jesus? And his reply was, well, you would get deeper truths of the Bible. Yeah. And... And, and and it would motivate you. you. You'd be motivated. And I said, oh, I'm already motivated with what knowledge I have. I said, let's see, my sins have been removed. You're telling me about this guy in 1600. I said, my sins have been removed because of what Jesus did on the cross. He's guaranteed I'm be resurrected from the dead. So he's, 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 he's got provided an escape route. I can live beyond the grave constant monitoring and making sure anything, any mistakes are covered. He's there to mediate for me 24 seven. I said, dude, I said, that, that's as deep as I'm digging. I said, to me, that is the deep truths of the Bible. My sins are removed and I'd be raised from the dead. I said, man, what? But he said, I would have more motivation if I'd read what this guy said in 1600, in mid 1600s. I said, no, I don't know who he is. Jesus, I know. I read about him, but I don't know where your dude is. I don't read about him in the Bible at all. Well, I think it comes from the, you know, passages like Hebrews 6 that says, let us leave the elementary truths, you know, about Christ and go on to maturity. And it, it kind of lists some simple things, you know, repentance and from from sin and, you know, faith in God. And But I think his whole point was they weren't putting those things into practice. I mean, I think the Bible looks at maturity as more of it's not just believing in Jesus, acknowledging that he's real, but there's actually a, a maturity that comes from your life where he lives in you and you're you're doing these things, you know. But most people think, oh, there's some, if this is elementary, there's some college course in here somewhere that I need to learn that's that's beyond Jesus and and daily life. And th that's where you get into trouble, in my opinion. What, I mean, I don't know what y'all think. Well, <clears throat> I think you're right, Jason. You know, I'm a bit of an Old Testament buff. You know, I, I loved it when we studied it when you and I were in school together. And and I kept studying it. And, and what it did for me, it didn't make me, like, want to go under law. You know, it, what it did was it just showed me the power of, it enhanced my understanding of the gospel because I just saw how God had worked it all the way through. And he was the same. I mean, he's yesterday, today, and forever. So it was mm -hmm. Yahweh dealt with people a little bit differently than Jesus did when he came here, but it was the same God. It was just historically a different time. But so all that helped me in my understanding, but it didn't change 
any of the simplicity of what the gospel does and who Jesus is. So I think that's the way you have to right. approach Bible study, you know, as an All enhancement right. of who God is. Well, right, because it's leading you to a relationship instead of a, of a diploma in that, oh, you've learned all the books of the Bible, because that's what we do, you know, with kids in Bible class, you, that we give them facts, 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 which is fine. Yeah. But at some point, the fact has to reveal itself as a living being that you can have a relationship with. Because I read that in Hebrews 6, but, you know, I think it's First Peter Two there, it says something about uh, like newborn babies, you know, crave spiritual milk. And then all the references Jesus said, unless you change and become like little children. I mean, there's a part of us has an innocence like a kid to a father as God that is important. And that's so simple that people miss it. And then another another part is there is something about maturity, but it's more about putting who Jesus is in your life, understanding repentance. And we, we understand what immaturity is in the church. You see people, they say, oh, Jesus is the Lord of my life. And then the next night, you know, they go to, you know, some bar going to, you know, share Jesus in quotation marks. And they wind up, you know, in jail making a phone call. And, and you're like, what, 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 what happened? Well, it was just a pretty immature stunt. This is not Jesus living. Now, you could have justified it, and I think that's more what it is. It's not because you understand, you know, the book of Ezekiel back in the Old Testament on how the rattling bones of, where's that, Ezekiel 36, I love, or somewhere in there, on on that God has the power to make armies out of dead bones and all the issues of why Ezekiel wrote that, you know? Right. Well, let's take another break. Um, there was a, I got a letter this last week when the, usually stuff that comes to the church, I'll get it on Sundays when I'm there. And I got a letter from a couple, I think they're from Arkansas. It was a nice letter, but they, they're struggling with us talking about, uh, and Jace, they use your phrase that there are no rules. <clears throat> in in Christianity, and the, they're trying to wrap their brain around it. And so I wanted to bring it up at some point for us to talk about it because what they said was that they want to be able to hold on to the ten. You know, it's like we, we understand about everything. You know, all the other laws, but but those ten. You know, we 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 got We got to keep those. You know, we got to hold the hold yeah. the, That has to be part of uh, part of what we're doing. And I hadn't responded to him because I thought we'd talk about it here at some point. But I think it's just what we're talking about today, that you can't yeah. you can't take part of the old covenant and somehow keep yeah. yourself under it. I mean, and so that idea. So let's talk a little bit about that, just the idea. Oh, I, We've discussed read, it before, but yeah. it keeps coming I, up. You know, with I read somewhere that 80-something percent of Christians, in quotation marks, believe you know, that we're under the Ten Commandments. And I'm like, what? Right. Now, before you say, what the heck? Those are good principles. Yes. There's yep. right and wrong. There's good and evil. And we have a responsibility to do the good. Everybody agrees with that. It's more about the motivation. Are you going to? It'd be like to compare this to marriage. Because if you look, if you fast forward. And this is off the top of my head. So I'm. I'm, I'm rambling to a point, but if we're married to Jesus, which we are, right? We're the bride of Christ. Well, I'm married in my own life, married to Missy. If on day one, I went in there and said, okay, here are the 10 rules that you will follow. And let's say they were all good things. I will guarantee you if that was my approach on day one, it probably would have would have not gone well. It wouldn't have gone well. And so you say, well, what's your point? My point is <clears throat> we're not under law. Colossians 2 is very clear on that. When Jesus died on a cross, he nailed that to the cross. We are no longer under, under the supervision of the law, Galatians 3. I mean, how yep. many would I have to read for people to say, well, that's what it says. It's for freedom. Christ set us free. So then you say, well, how come we do right? And when you throw in Romans 6, should we go on sinning 
so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. No. So we surrendered ourselves. We come in contact with the blood of Jesus. He nailed the, the law to the cross. And so we're motivated to do right because, one, Jesus died for our sins. And number two, he forgave us when he died. So there's a motivation. So grace, the grace of God, teaches us to say no to worldly passions and pleasure. But we're not doing it to keep the rules. We're not under rules. There, there are no right. rules. That's why we're saying that. So people think, well, if you don't make rules, you'll never do right. And I say, au contraire. It's a love based relationship oriented trust that you wake up every day and said, I died Romans six. Cause it's that he makes that argument and Jesus died for me. And I'm going to try to do right. Cause I love Jesus and I appreciate what he did for me. So, so if a human it. being, a human being says, I live by this code. I love my God. And I love my neighbor. If I do so, more and more, like Jesus did. He loved the Father. He loves us. So you're left with, you say, let's see now. So am I going to budge on obey God and him only? He said, no, nope, I love him enough. I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to try my very best to do what he said. I'm not going to bow down to anything or anybody other than him, the God of heaven. I'm not going to, uh, let's see, number three, I'm not going to misuse his name. A person who loves God is not going to have slips of the tongue where they curse God. No, they're not going to do that. They're going to learn to be so in love with him, they're never going to mock yeah. him by cursing with their mouth hit. Then you say, so he said, work six days, rest one. Sounds like it makes sense to me. Have a day of rest every week. Sounds good to me. You say, so as a pattern, yep, that'd be, that'd be a good thing. But it's not a law not a where law. if you work seven days in a row, that somehow or another you've breached the that, written code. That's right. That's right. You say, that's a good good policy. Take my day of rest. But you say, but what if... Uh, What's the difference between Saturday and Sunday? I said, no difference, just time. Then children obey their father and mother. You say, yeah, they love God and they love each other. They tend to turn out better. Uh, don't murder. I think it's pretty common sense. You don't murder. I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm not going to kill him. You say, <laughs> I'm not going to go around murdering my neighbor. I'm going to love him. Don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. If you look at all those things, you say, you will develop a righteousness if you go forward and you love God and you love your neighbor. You don't get up and say, I've got to make sure today that I don't steal from my neighbor like I've been doing. I don't go over there when he's not there and steal his stuff. I yeah. love him too much for that. He's my neighbor. I love him. I'm not going to steal his stuff. Instead it, of saying, I've got to make sure I don't steal today because I, in the past I had a habit of doing a lot of thievery, so i got to make sure every day. But I think people are going to say, well, you're saying the same thing. You're doing the same things, but it's a big difference because when you have it like a rule system, like we're under law and rules, then all of a sudden the you make up rules under the rules. So it's like you, know, you could take, let's just take uh, Hebrews 10 where it says don't give up. Uh, meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. Well, there's some people who are rule-oriented. If you, based on that verse, if you miss a meeting, they call it sin because they've made a rule system based on what they're reading, and there's no wiggle room. Now, they'll say you can be forgiven, but you got to confess that. Well, my deal is... If you're in love with God and you understand you're not under a rule system and you do miss and your heart is right, let's say you miss two in a row, you're you're not you're not sinning. 
There, there's not. This is not a rule <clears throat> system. When you're, <clears throat> you know, you're right, Jay's. Uh, hang on, Dad. Let's take a, another break. You're, you're right, Jay's. And and the reason what's ironic, you used Hebrews ten, because that's what I was thinking. This uh, and this is great. And for you folks that uh, sent me that letter from Arkansas. Reading the book of Hebrews is the biggest help for you. Because think about it. It's hard for us to wrap our mind around it now, 2,000 years later. Think about how much harder it was for those initial Jews who had been under this system all this time to then embrace this freedom. And that's why they kept kept doing it. Like they just switched the Sabbath to Sunday. Some of them were like, well, yeah, well, now it, the Sunday's the Sabbath. But they, they did that. You know, it, that wasn't from, from God. So it's hard to not want to live under rules. And dad's right. You, you want to live in such a way that you're motivated by what Jesus said. Because he said all the law can yep. be summed up in these two things. Love That's God, right. love your neighbor. So when you look back, you say, well, what was the purpose of the law of Moses to begin with? All these things in Hebrews 9, the first covenant, the law of Moses, had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary, the temple. Well, you drop on down, everything had been arranged where they'd go in there and the priest would enter regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people who committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this, and to your point of a while ago, Jace, about we're not under law, the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed. God had not become flesh yet and, and never break a rule or a law as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. It just, it just wasn't happen. They're only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Help is on the way. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation, not something built out of wood or stone or gold. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they're outwardly clean. Mm. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason... Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he's died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Well, if you can't can't grab it, if you can't grab it from there, I don't know what to tell you. That's why I love Phil. The next chapter, which is chapter 10, I've heard sermons and I've heard people say that, you know, about the not meeting together, that's in 1025. Because 1026 says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. They're like, I'm telling you, if you don't meet together, because those two verses are beside each other, they're like, that's a deliberate sinning. Oh, he's not saying that at all. <laughs> he, he's saying the whole picture of, of 10 is the old law versus the new law. And we even see that in our world. You know, movies that portray this, that people are sacrificing bulls and goats, they always make it creepy and crazy. And, oh, they're this is some kind of cult, cult, ritualistic. These people are nuts because they're trying to do anything, you know, from an academia standpoint to disrupt the Old Testament 
because they're like, oh, that's just incorrect, which it is kind of crazy that that was going on. But then here comes a man that's not crazy, Jesus, the image of God, and he is capitally punished for the sins of the world after proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's, that he's God. And that message that he sends to us is that he's for us, he loves us, there'll be no more rule system, there'll be no more sacrifices needed. And so guess what? Let's, let's meet together. Let's spur one another in the name of Jesus. I mean, two, two, two chapters later, he's going to say, let us fix our eyes on the author and per perfecter of our faith, Jesus. Let us throw off the sin that's so easily entangled. So it's more of a maturity thing when you back all the way up to where we started with Hebrews 6. I mean, if you're claiming to love Jesus and have gone all in on Jesus, and you've reenacted Jesus in water, and you buried the old self, it seems kind of kind of silly if you're out there on a daily basis doing a lot of cutting up. And if you're never, you know, or you're in the habit of not meeting with the brothers and you're cutting up, well, that just seems kind of silly. Not because you're under law. It's just because you've made a vow to God in Jesus that you're simply not keeping it's Sim not true simply put jesus said here's the deal i'm coming down i'm going to keep every jot and tittle of the law i'm going to actually keep it but i'm the only one ever that will in fact have kept it 100 percent flawlessly perfect yeah. of course he could say uh by the way i wrote it <laughs> So what he wrote, Wait. he kept and then said, all you have to do is put your faith in me. I'll become sin for you, and I'll get rid of it by my sacrifice, the one sacrifice, no animals. I keep it, and I'll die to bring you out from under it. That's what he did. Yeah. It's well, a that's beautiful said, thing. That's why he said that. Go ahead. No, let's take another break. So that's why he said that the law, along with prophecy and everything, was fulfilled in him. That's so right. yeah. that was the whole purpose of everything. So, Jace, you started this out with a with an illustration in marriage, and that's exactly what Paul did in Romans 7 to get into this discussion. And here's what he, after he talked about marriage, then he said in verse 4, he, So, my brothers, you also died to the law. Through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. And yep. so, I mean, that, that's pretty clear. The idea there is that in Christ, the law holds no, no bind on anybody anymore because it's been fulfilled in him. The law is good. He goes on to say later, not, there's nothing wrong with law because he, he asked the question, is the law sin? Sure, It's a not. great code. He said, it's a great yeah. code. There's nothing wrong with it because God wrote it. The problem right. is if you try to keep that as part of your connection to salvation, you've put yourself under the whole law. I mean, you're never get, you're going to be frustrated and utility, and then you become a a law enforcer, which is what a lot of church houses have become. They're under right. law. Well, then you got if you're going to be under, you got to enforce it, or it's no good. If you don't enforce the law, so then you start getting into the weeds of law breaking and and you become policemen and, and every time of, you violate the law you died again i died right. again last night i blew it i'm out this is it oh it's over well there's a verse that that addresses my point about the example i used in hebrews 10 which i'm not sure where it is you google it and find it but it says uh it is for freedom that christ set us free but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil Yep. So that's when people, what, what people struggle with is, well, how do I live a Christian life if I'm not under law? Because it's how do I live a Christian life and never make a mistake? Well, but they'll say if you don't give me the law, then I'll how how am I going to know how to keep it? Well, there's four books in the Bible that that I think shows you how to do that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yep. You, If Jesus is your Lord and you read those on a continual basis, you will see how, how to act. 
and my point is, is this. Let's take something controversial, which is Matthew 11, where it said that Jesus had a reputation for being a glutton and a drunkard. How do you get that reputation? You, do, you go places that most Christians don't go. Because true, especially rule-keeping Christians, they don't have that reputation. Guess what? Because a lot of them would take that law, like say a bar, and they'd say, that would be wrong. That would be He's breaking. He's a wine bibber, the King the, James said, a yeah. wine bibber. But they would say, if a person said, I went to a bar, they'd say, well, that, that's a sin, which it's not. Would you agree? I agree 100%. And that, but they would try to make a law, and they would give you the excuses on why that's true. But I know Jesus had that reputation. So where I made mistakes in, in my past, like with my kids, is I would tell them, you know, they would have a friend that was shady, and I'd say, hey, you need to get away from them. Well, you know, I was trying to protect my kid. But the more I got in touch with Jesus, I realized that he would go around shady people, and he would go to shady places. But he would never exchange his character for it because we know that he never sinned. I mean, we have multiple verses that say he never sinned, he never sinned, he never sinned, he never sinned. But he had that reputation. So I'm like, that's how we should operate. But it's hard to operate like that because you've got so many rule-oriented you know, Christians who are saying, oh, you can't go there. Don't be yoked with unbelievers. They'll take a verse, treat it like a rule, and if you associate with them, they're like, well, you're yoked with unbelievers. That's a sin. And look, some of y'all may think this is crazy. You think people don't in the church don't really do that. Every day and twice on Sunday, <laughs> every day, they they get into rule-oriented discussions about every little move that you make. And you're like, well, I'm trying to be like Jesus. They're like, yeah, yeah. No, I really am. So Jay, <laughs> I'm trying to go Jason, out there and save them. You're going to have to trust me you. like we trust Jesus that he would go into shady places and talk with shady people, but he wouldn't compromise his character and he wouldn't use his freedom as a cover-up for evil. You're just going to have to trust me on that. Which was the whole point of Luke 15. We've talked about it before with the lost coin um, and the lost son and the lost sheep was that started by them saying, look at this guy. I mean, look at the people he's hanging around with. And then that prompted those three parables that he told, which we've talked about on the podcast. Jace, that verse you were referring to was Galatians 5.13. You, okay. my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. And then I love what he says in 14. The entire law is summed up in a single command. So Paul said just one. Love your neighbor as yourself, which is kind of the whole point we've been talking about. The first that came from Jesus. Now Paul affirms it in, in this all of his letters, but especially this one in Galatians, that you've been set free. Mm -hmm. But but that doesn't give you a right to go. You don't want to go around sinning because we died to that. Why would you want to live in that? Which he also says in Romans 6. Yeah, I think that says the same thing. Uh, I think I was thinking of another verse, but that actually says it better. There's one that says don't use it as a cover up for evil, which is yeah. interesting because your heart has if the word cover up, what does that imply? You're hiding it, something. Yeah, you're like, Oh, I'm free to do anything. I mean, a lot of us that have shared Jesus with people who have had some kind of addiction, you know, drugs or alcohol, that comes up a lot because they're like well, I'm I'm free to go anywhere and do anything, but there comes a point where you know if you've had a problem with this, it's probably wise in Jesus, grace motivated, not to go there or run with them. And that's an individual decision, but I think that's what it means because they're like, yeah, but I'm free just so you'll let them out of your sight. And then when they get out of your sight, they do all this mischief. But guess what? That's a heart problem. And that's, there's nothing, you you can't give them a set of rules and make them follow it. it it's just not going to work. It's not going to work. Right. It's not It's not how God designed it. I'm sorry, but he just, he designed it to be gross, grace motivated. Yeah. Your, your walk and it, before God says a lot about who you are. Your, yeah. your walk. 
I was going to say that because that's the example that we use. But we hit it because it's really all about what motivates you. It, it was earlier discussion about why do people pontificate on all this stuff that doesn't doesn't mean anything and like to sound smart. It's like a politician. I think people do that in the religious world. They like to make it sound like, well, they got it going on. And then how many times have you seen those people? Then you find out later they were sure making rules for you, but then for them, they had all kinds of bad stuff going on, a bunch of yeah. terrible stuff. It happens every single day. Yeah. And then they just destroy whole churches because they put their faith in this person instead of in Jesus. So I see how it happens, and you see the damage that it causes when you really don't have the right motivation on. Yeah, one, yeah. one good point in all of this is when we're working with our neighbors, uh, they have to remember uh, – I can't save them. Jace can't save them. Al, you can't save them. We can't save them. We're pointing nope. them to the one who can. But they need to understand, you observe my walk, my life, my way of life. You can observe that. But at the end of the day, I cannot save you. I'll just point you to the one who can. I'll love you. I'll be quick to forgive whatever mistakes you make. And you, and you just move forward. That's about all we got. Yeah, Nobody's going to go through this thing mistake-free. I don't care how many rules they bring up. It's just another rule that people break. We're going to make some mistakes. I would say keep the rules at a minimum at best. <laughs> That's exactly right, which is a good way to end this discussion. I think uh, I think if we hadn't called this podcast Unashamed, we could have called it Priscilla and Akella podcast because all we're trying to do is explain the ways of Jesus more adequately. And that, and you do that by continuing to see what he said and what he did while he was here. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.